Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Uh, the lecture today is about assignment three and it's being given out on a Friday um, because of a missed midterm break lecture. So the university rescheduled this class for a Friday. So that's why it's given out on a Friday. Um, assignment two is not quite due yet. So that is due on the 19th. Today is the 15th. However, I wanted to give you as much time as possible to work on assignment three. Uh, because of all the assignments, assignment three is probably uh, the most pure programming that you'll do on any of the assignments. It's not complicated stuff. It's not stuff that you have to think about too much, but it is a lot of like work, a lot of hours that you have to put into it. So um, let's have a look at what the assignment is before we get into the technical description. Um, so assignment three is going to be what I'm calling Mega Mario. And so, you know, this is for educational purposes, so don't worry about any sort of copyright infringement, etc. cetera. Uh, when the game starts up, you're gonna have this menu system and the menu is already done for you. So you don't have to worry about the menu system. I just put in the menu system so that you could um, select between different levels and you can see how different scenes are going to work. So for example here, if I choose, uh, uh, if I press D to play, then I'm now playing Mega Mario. So Mega Mario is a 2D platforming game with all the physics that you could think of for a 2D platforming game um, with, a, with a few more. So here, for example, if I jump on top of this brick, I'll land on it and I can walk back and forth. If I hit this brick from underneath, uh, it'll be destroyed and an animation will be played. Um, also, there's a question mark block. If I go um, on top of the question mark block, nothing happens. But if I hit it, um, it changes color and a coin appears and rotates for a little bit and then disappears. Um, you can see that Mega Man has a running animation. He has a standing animation and also a jumping animation. So the jumping animation and the standing animation are just one frame that it doesn't actually change. However, you can see that when I'm running to the right, Mega Man is facing right, and when I'm running to the left, Mega Man is facing left. And when I'm running, running, <laughs> in either direction, there are four frames of animation that loop. And if you tuned into the last class where we talked about animations and stuff, um, you'll know how that works. So you're going to have to implement that in this assignment. So there are various things uh, in this world that you can see here. There are some clouds, and we don't actually um, interact with these clouds. So the reason we don't interact with those clouds is because in our assignment, we're giving certain things bounding boxes and other things aren't, be give, aren't being given bounding boxes. And if you can give me just one second, I apologize. My cat is screaming to get outside. So I'm going to let him out. That'll take me about 30 seconds. Just give me one sec. All right, sorry about that. He was making a lot of noise, really wanted to get outside. So where was I? Oh yeah, so some things in this game have bounding boxes and some things don't. And so here I have a little debug menu or a debug way of viewing things where I can actually turn on the bounding boxes. And if you can see around Mega Man now, we have this white bounding box being drawn and that is the bounding box that we're going to be using for collision. And as you can see, there's nothing being drawn on top of this uh, cloud here because the cloud just simply hasn't been given a bounding box. Similarly, this decoration down here hasn't been given a bounding box either. Now, if I press the T key, all of the textures will disappear. So T for um, texture, C for collision. So in this view, you're kind of seeing like the matrix, right? So this view tells you exactly what um, the game engine is seeing in terms of its collisions. So I can go around. This is a, a brick here. So you can see that as soon as I hit that brick, um, there's no longer anything there to collide with. However, there is an explosion, but we don't collide with the explosion. All right. And we'll, I'll explain how to do that in a bit. So you're going to go on um, with the level. And let me turn off the bounding boxes for a second. Mega Man can also shoot. So if you press the space bar, Mega Man will shoot. 
and the bullet will last for two seconds before disappearing. The bullets can kill the bricks, but they can't kill these other blocks, okay? So for example here, if I want to finish the level, I can go out um, to the right, climb up the end, and then we're going to finish the level when we touch the flagpole. So when the flagpole is touched, you go back to the start. Uh, similarly, when you fall down a pit, you're going to go back to the start as well. So that, that's the other mechanic to this game. And that's basically all there is to the game. However, it's, it's very easy and it takes only a short amount of time to show you the game mechanics, but of course, to actually describe everything in like the game design, the technical specifications of the game, um, that's going to take us probably the rest of the class, right? So it it's always takes such a little amount of time to show things, but such a, a long amount of time to, to technically describe things. So with that in mind, uh, let's go into the readme file for the game. I'll go through the readme file. And then at the end of the readme file, I have a um, suggested order in which you tackle the assignment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through that suggested order and show you all of the functions in the code and the project that you'll be getting for this assignment. So let's go back to the assignment here and I will open the readme file and now we'll go through the readme file. Okie doke. So all this stuff uh, up here is the same. You will just be submitting the entire source folder of the assignment. So you're not adding any files to the assignment, but you can add any number of functions that you want to the existing files. And of course, uh, put in your group members names when you go to submit on D2L. All right, let's look at the program specification now. Let me bring up uh, the project background so it's a little bit easier on the eyes. All right, so in this assignment, you will be writing a game that was presented in class, okay? So what I just showed you, that's the game that you're writing. So this game must have the following features. So it will have assets. Entities in the game will be rendered using various textures and animations, which we will be calling assets, along with fonts. So we don't have sounds in this assignment just yet. Assets are loaded once at the beginning of the program and stored in the assets class, which is stored in the game engine class. All of the assets are stored in assets.txt with the syntax defined below. So the assets class is already done for you in this assignment. You do not have to worry about how to implement the assets class. It's done. However, what you will be doing um, is implementing the loading of the levels, which I'll get to. So don't worry, all that asset stuff, that's going to follow what we did in the slides, but I have given you this assets.h and assets.cpp, that's already done for you. So all you're going to have to do is call assets.load from file, and it already has loaded the assets into the game for you. Okay, let's keep going. And I'll show you the syntax of the assets file once we get a bit closer to that. So note, this is an important note for this assignment. All entity positions denote the center of their rectangular sprite. So in this assignment, everything is going to be a rectangle. So we talked about axis align bounding boxes. That's what we're going to be using for collisions in this assignment. Everything is going to be a rectangle. And the positions denote the center of the rectangle. It also denotes the center of the bounding box if it has a bounding box. And the way that we set the middle of the sprite to be the position is via sprite.setOrigin. So we did that in assignment two, we set the position of the circle to be the middle of the circle. In assignment three, we've done the same thing, but it's just now with, the, um, with a rectangle instead of a circle. Okay, so the player, there's a surprising amount of things that the player has to do. So the player is the Mega Man character on the screen. The player entity in the game is represented by Mega Man, which has several different animations, stand, run, and air. You must determine which state the player is in and assign the correct animation. So over here in components, so a component for this assignment is, there's lots of different components, we have a state component. So all this component does is it takes in a string. 
okay? So that string, uh, by default, is just going to be jumping. You have to tell whether or not uh, Mega Man is uh, in the air, whether it's standing, or whether it's running. You can use jumping for that, you can use air, you can use whatever you want. However, you just have to assign the correct animation based on what the animation or what the current state of the of the player is. So for example, if you've detected that on this frame the player has collided from the top with a tile, then it's standing on the tile, so it should be given the standing animation. If it hasn't collided with anything, then it's in the air, so you should detect that and then assign the correct state based on that and the correct animation. So, so that's what that is. Um, the player moves with the following controls. So left is the A key, right is the D key, jump is the W key, and shoot is the space key. The player can move left, move right, or shoot at any time during the game. This, this means that the player can move left or right while they're in the air. So if I just show this off in the game engine, um, you can see here that if I'm in the, in the air, I can move back and forth while in the air. So if I jump off here to the left, I can come back to the right, etc. <clears throat> and, and Mega Man can also shoot while they're in the air. Okay. The player can only jump if it is currently standing on a tile. What does that mean? Well, it means that um, in some games you may be able to like double jump. So if I'm standing on a tile, then I can press the W key to jump. See that? But if I press the W key when I'm in the air already, it won't jump again. So you have to, to detect when it is actually legal for Mega Man to jump or when it's not legal to jump. If the jump key is held, the player should not continuously jump but instead it should only jump once per button press. If the player lets go of the jump key mid jump, it should start falling back down immediately. So let me show that. So if the player is on the ground and you've chosen to jump, holding down the W key, so I'm, I'm still holding it, okay? But it's not continuously jumping, right? It's not just bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And if I let go of the jump key mid-jump, the player will immediately start, start falling back down again. Okay? Okay. Um, if the player moves left or right, the player's sprite will face in that direction until the other direction has been pressed. So I showed that off already. Bullets shot by the player travel in the direction that the player is facing. So let me run it again. If I'm facing to the right and I shoot, I'm shooting to the right. If I'm facing to the left and I shoot, I'm facing, I'm shooting to the left. That's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Players collide with tile entities in the level and cannot move through them. The player lands on a tile entity and stands in place if it falls on it from above. And we've already demonstrated that. Um, the player does not collide with deck entities in the level. And I'll explain what tile are and deck are later. Um, well, let me just do it now. So if I open up the assignment and I have the level file, um, oops, that's still showing the code running. So this is the level file, okay? In the level file, I've simply just written tile, ground, and then a location but I have tiles as well as deck. So what we're saying is a tile is something that can be collided with. A deck is just a decoration. So you do not assign a bounding box to a decoration. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but essentially the bush, um, the clouds, etc., are just decorations in the level and they are not going to be given a bounding box. Okay. Um, if the player falls below the bottom of the screen, then they restart at the start, respawn at the start. The player should have a gravity component, which constantly accelerates it downward on the screen until it collides with a tile. So what that means is that when we run the game, the player is constantly affected by gravity. Okay, so the gravity is like some interesting value. 
that that's been given. I think that's specified in the configuration file. And when I jump, what, what happens is I'm not actually telling the player to move back down. It's just that whenever the player happens to be in the air, it's being pulled down by gravity. So gravity is an acceleration. So in your movement system, previously all you did was you added the velocity to your position to change the position. But now what you're going to do in this assignment is you have a gravity or an acceleration. So the acceleration is added to velocity every time. So essentially what happens is I'm going up with some velocity and then as time goes on, it the gravity keeps getting added to the velocity and eventually the upwards motion becomes a downwards motion. And then whenever I land on something, I just set the velocity to zero, okay? Because if I didn't set the velocity to zero when I hit something, I'll continuously be affected by gravity and go faster and faster and faster until I just pass through blocks. And so whenever you detect that you've landed on top of a block or when you've hit a block from above, just set the velocity to zero. And that's how you do that. Um, the player has a maximum speed specified in the level file, which should not ex be exceeded in either the X or Y direction. The player will be given a bounding box of a size specified in the level file. And the player's sprite and bounding box are centered on the player's position. So all that is kind of intuitive, but you know, I just want it all to be here so you can reference it as a programming document. Um, animations. We're going to have animations as well. And once I explain this, um, we're going to go, actually, let me go over the assets file now. So the assets file, um, here is the texture asset file specification. So let me open the assets file. So we have a file here called assets.txt. And if we look in here, I have a folder called fonts and I have a folder called images. And inside images, I have folder for like Mega Man stuff. I have the folder for Mario stuff. So there are lots of different um, images included within this assignment. Um, the assets file specifies those images. So here is the assets file. And you can see that every line of the assets file is one of three different things. It's either a texture specification, it's an animation specification, or it's a font specification. So font is really easy. We had the same thing last time um, where we have, uh, well, we didn't have an assets file, but it's essentially the same thing. So I'm going to say, here's a font. That font is called Arial. And the file name for that font file is in fonts slash Arial.ttf. Okay, so that is where the file is actually located. And then within our game engine, I can just say, hey, assets class, please give me the font called Arial, and I'll be able to draw text with that. Uh, next, we have textures. So the way we specify a texture is we say texture as the first thing on the line. Then we say uh, text stand. So for example, this is the standing texture. I've just given these all uh, a prefix of tech um, in order to specify that they're a texture. And then here is the file where that texture lives. So pretty easy. And so what happens is in the assets class, um, there is a font map, there's an animation map, and there's a texture map. So the texture map is going to um, store strings to textures. So when we say I have a texture um, called text stand, and that is in images slash Mega Man slash stand 64, it reads this into an SFML texture and stores it in that map which is indexed by text stand. So whenever I want to set the um, texture of something in the game, that's, that's how I do it, by using text stand. And finally, we have animations. So animations are similarly uh, specified, where it's first it's the word animation, then it's the name of the animation, then it is the texture that we load in order to play the animation. And so the textures, again, they hold all the different frames of animation. So if I go over here and I look at images, Mega Man, um, run, uh, we actually have the run 64 is the one that I want here. And that is going to be um, four frames of animation 
which contain the running animation for Mega Man. Okay, so that is run 64. Um, and so you can see here that we have a texture that we load called tech run, and that is the run64.png. But down here we have an animation called run, which uses the running texture. It has four frames of animation, and that animation should change every 10 in-game frames. Okay. Um, so that's how the animations are specified. So for example, we have a question block that is comes from tech Q, which has four frames of animation that cycle every 10 in-game frames. So let's see what that one looks like. So if we go into Mario, um, we have tech Q, which is this one here. And so this is, oh, no, that's not the right one. Where is that one? So tech Q, we go up here, Q fade. So that is that one, sorry. So this, this texture, it's hard to see right here, but this actually does go from a brighter to a slightly lesser um, bright back up, back up in brightness. So if I run the game, um, you'll see sort of those, those question mark blocks are fading in and out a little bit. So that's how we do our animations, is that's how we specify them. Okay, so that is uh, the assets class. And again, all of the loading of this data is done for you in the assets class. Let's go back to the readme file and we'll explain what you have to do for animations. So it said see below for an, uh, animation asset specification. That's what we, we just talked about. Animations are implemented by storing multiple frames inside a texture. The animation class handles the frame advancement based on animation speed you need to implement the animation update function to properly progress animations, and you need to implement animation has ended, which returns true if an animation has finished its last frame and false otherwise, okay? So animations can be repeating, meaning they loop forever, or non-repeating, like they play once. So, uh, for example, in the game, if I run it again, the question mark fade, that is a repeating animation. Uh, the running animation is a repeating animation. However, the explosion animation is not a repeating animation. If that explosion was just happening over and over and over again, that wouldn't make much sense. Okay, so we've specified whether or not they are to repeat. Um, and, and an animation with a non-repeating animation should be destroyed once it's has ended, returns true, okay? So this is how we're going to implement stuff like that. So inside our game engine, we're going to specify whether or not an animation, when we load it onto an entity, should be repeating or not. So if it's repeating, it just plays forever. Otherwise, if an entity has an animation that is not repeating, we're going to destroy it. So here's what happens with this brick right here. What happens is when I hit it from below, we take the entity that I collided with, which currently has a brick animation, we change that animation to an explode animation, and we say that that animation should not repeat. And then inside our, our game engine, whenever we see that a non-repeating animation has finished, all we have to do is destroy that entity. Sounds a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite simple. So whenever I, I play that animation and it finishes, now the entity is automatically destroyed for me. So that's pretty cool. That, that, it, it's, really, it's a really powerful system that lets us do really cool stuff. Okay, let's go back to the file. So that's animations. And what you have to do, if we look at the animation class over here, is um, you have to go to the slides where I did the calculation of how to update the animation for an entity. And you just put that in here, okay? So you implement this animation update and you also um, implement animation has ended. So that's the two things that you have to do with animations. Everything else has been done for you. Back to the readme. Decoration entities. Decorations um, or deck, in the level file are simply drawn to the screen and do not interact with any entities in any way in the gameplay. 
Decorations can be given an animation in the game, but intuitively they should be reserved for things like clouds or bushes, etc. Those are the things that don't collide with anything in the game. Excuse me. All right. Tiles. Tiles are a little bit more complicated than uh, decorations. So tiles are entities that define the level geometry and interact with the players. Tiles can be, can be given any animation that's defined in the assets file. Tiles will be given a bounding box equal to the size of the animation. And so you can get the animation size um, with this code here, okay? Um, so you get the tile, you get component, see animation, and you get the animation, and then you get the size. That's how you get that. Um, the current animation displayed for a tile can be uh, retrieved with this. So for example, if you wanted to know, hey, is this a brick animation? Is it a explode animation? You can get the name of the animation uh, by doing this. And tiles have different behavior based on which animation that you give them. Okay, so even though um, tiles in the game may be animated or not, okay, so for example, um, this brick technically is animating, it just has one frame of animation, okay? This tile, which is a question mark, is animating and it has multiple frames of animation. So if we go back to the assets file real quick, um, let's see what the brick does. So the texture for the brick is in images slash Mario slash brick dot PNG. So if I go images Mario brick, you can see here that there's just one frame of animation in this texture. So when I go to specify the animation for a brick, I just say animation brick. It uses the brick texture. It has one frame. And it doesn't matter how many frames it takes to update, so we just put in zero. Because anything with only one frame of animation, it never actually updates, right? It just keeps playing the same frame of animation. Okay. So, brick tiles. Brick tiles are given the brick animation. When a brick collides with a bullet or is hit by a player from below, uh, its animation should change to explosion. Non-repeating animation entities are destroyed when has ended is true. So that means that when you hit it from below, its animation will change to explosion. And then when the explosion finishes, the, the brick will, or the tile will automatically be destroyed. Um, and its bounding box component should be removed. So this is a subtle little thing, but let me go back to the solution to show you what I mean. Whenever I hit a brick, it... Like, it, I collide with bricks, right? Right away, I collide with bricks. If I hit it from below, it's going to change its animation to an explosion. However, I want to be able to pass through that explosion. So the second thing that I have to do whenever I detect that I've hit a brick from below is immediately remove the bounding box component. So if you watch, I'm going to jump into the brick. It's going to start playing the explosion animation and I'll be able to pass through the explosion animation. See that? Because I've removed the bounding box. Now over here, I'm going to show you with the bounding box turned on so that you can see that once I hit the brick from below, this white bounding box will disappear. See how it disappears right away? That means we've removed the bounding box so it no longer collides. So something that's pretty complicated if you think about it. You're detecting if a brick is hit from below, you're changing the animation to an explosion, you're removing the bounding box, you're letting the explosion play, and then the ex once the explosion is over, you destroy the entity. If we were using something like, like object-oriented design for this game, that would be a severely complicated process. But with ECS, you just have a system that handles the animations, you have a system that handles the, the lifespan, you have a system that handles the physics, and it all just works, and it's, it's so easy to do. Okay, the second kind of tile is a question tile. Question tiles are given the question animation when created. When a question tile is hit from below, two things happen. Its animation changes to the darker question two animation, 
and a temporary lifespan entity with the coin animation should appear for 30 frames, 64 pixels above the location of the question entity. All right, so let me explain one more thing here, which is actually very important. Um, if you press the G key, you will get this grid overlaid on your game. Our game is going to be laid out for the most part on a 32 pixel by 32 pixel grid. And what I've done down here is I've specified 0, 0 in grid coordinates in the bottom left, just to make it a little bit easier when you go to, to look at levels and stuff. So if you think about 64 pixels above where uh, the question mark is hit, actually, that should be 32 pixels because this is 30. No, sorry. The, this is 64 by 64, not 32 by 32. So each of these blocks are 64 by 64 pixels. And so when I say create a coin 64 pixels above where the question mark is, then that should equate to a coin which is exactly in the center of the grid space above it. Okay. Now, this grid doesn't affect gameplay whatsoever. Like we can still move at an individual pixel level. However, the grid is there because that's how the level is going to be defined in the level file. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but it's just there for you. Uh, I've implemented this drawing of the grid for you to have an easier time visualizing things. Okie doke. Um, something that's good for you is that entity rendering has been completely implemented for you. I have implemented all of the entity rendering in the rendering system, so you do not ever have to touch anything related to rendering, which is really, really nice. Okay. Bonus. Any special effects which do not alter gameplay in a significant way, so they can alter gameplay, but you still have to implement the functionality that I've, I've said for the assignment. So any special effects which do not alter gameplay in a, in a major way can be added up for 5% bonus marks on the assignment. Note that assignments cannot go over 100% total marks, but the 5% bonus can overwrite marks lost in other ways. Just give me one second. All right. You may develop a special weapon that has special effects which can also contribute to the 5%. And if you want to really go above and beyond, you can add NPCs to the game, like Goombas, for another 5% bonus. However, you can't go over 100, right? But you will... If you implement bonus stuff on the assignment and you end up asking for like a letter of reference for a job or something, I'll, I'll give you a really nice one. How about that? And what I always do is I always like showing off some of the more impressive bonus submissions in class. So just some miscellaneous stuff here. The P key should pause the game. Um, the T key toggles the drawing of textures. C draw toggles the bounding box drawing. G toggles the grid on or off. And the escape key should go back to the main menu or quit if you pressed it on the main menu. So here on the main menu, if I go into a level and I hit escape, I go back to the main menu, hit escape. That's how that works. And if I hit escape on the main menu, it quits the game. Okay. Level creation. For this level, you are also required to create your own level. This level should include some interesting gameplay. It does not need to be as large or as complicated as the one that I have put um, in the assignment, but you know, show off something interesting. Uh, include the level in the zip file as level.txt and I will show off some of the more interesting levels in class. There will be two configuration files in the assignment, uh, the asset config file and the level configuration file. Let's look at the level file because we've already looked at the asset stuff. Game levels will be specified in a level file, which will contain a list of entity specifications, one per line. It will also contain a single line which specifies the property of the player in that level. In this way, you can define an entire level in the data file rather than in programming code. The syntax of the lines of the level file are as follows. Here's an important note. All GX, GY positions in the level file 
are given in grid coordinates. The grid cells are of size 64 by 64 pixels, and the entity should be positioned such that the bottom left corner of its texture is aligned with the bottom left corner of the given grid coordinates. The grid starts at 0, 0 in the bottom left of the screen and can be seen by pressing the G key when the game is running. Um, so let's open up the level file. Here is a level file, and I'm also going to simultaneously open up the game. So here is the solution for the game, and let me, let me unmaximize that. Okie doke. So I'll minimize this stuff to make it a bit easier to see. So over here we have the level file, and I'm going to open up that level in the game to show you what that essentially means. So here I've defined some ground tiles, right? So the bottom row down here, and I know this is a little bit hard to see because it's not maximized anymore, but we have a bunch of tiles going along the bottom of the ground. And you can see here that I've specified tile ground zero zero, tile ground one zero. So the zero zero tile is right here. The one zero tile is here. Um, let's see. So I've got a, a brick at five three. This, this tile right here is five three. So I can look over here somewhere I've specified that brick, um, do, 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 tile brick 5.3, tile brick 7.3, tile brick 9.3. So that's how I've specified these tiles. Uh, tile question 9.6, so that refers to this one up here, right? I've also got deck cloud big 22.7. So where's 22.7? Oh wow, that one, oops, I don't, didn't want to delete that. That one refers to the tile that is over here, okay? And as you can see, you've got to do the computation such that the animation lines up with the bottom left of the tile that I've specified, okay? So for example, um, this pipe tall is at 15, zero, and that actually goes behind this um, in, the, in the level file. So it's pretty intuitive. It's pretty easy to make a level. It's just a lot of typing. Right? So if you go through, all of the tiles are specified like this. And then at the very end is the specification for the player. So let's just really quick look at what the player specification means. And we'll have this over here. Okay. So the player, and, and so the tile specification, it's really easy. It's just tile, animation name, grid X, and grid Y. The decoration is the exact same. It's just got deck instead of tile. The player specification um, is first GX, GY. That's the starting position of the player. So when you start the level, that's where the player should occur. Um, CW and CH are next. That is the bounding box width and height. Okay. So um, that's the collision width and the collision height. Um, and you can see in the game here that, so Mega Man's sprite is 64 by 64, but the bounding box is actually 48 by 48. It's a little bit smaller, and we discussed why that is in a previous lecture. You've got the left and right speed. You've got the jumping speed, and you might say, what the hell is jumping speed? Well, when you jump, all you have to do to jump is you set your vertical velocity. Okay, so you set the vertical velocity and Mega Man starts going upward. Um, it's got a maximum speed. That should be, uh, you've got to clamp your speed to that maximum speed. It's got a gravity. Um, so gravity here is 0 0.75. And what that means is gravity is pushing Mega Man downward. So it's increasing its downward velocity by 0.75 every frame. And the bullet animation is defined at right here. So this is pretty funny. Uh, if I change right here, brick, for example. So whenever I, if I launch the game again, after I've changed Mega Man's bullet animation, now Mega Man is shooting bricks. Okay, isn't that cool? And it's it gets destroyed whenever it, it interacts with something. So that is the player specification. So... This is a lot of stuff to do. This assignment is going to be a significant amount of work, 
but it's not complicated work. You're just programming a game, and this is intro to game programming. And sometimes games take a lot of work to implement. So I've done a lot of the heavy lifting for you. I have implemented um, the Entity Manager class is completely done for you, okay? The Game Engine class is completely done for you. Um, the Menu class is completely done for you. The Scene class is completely done for you. All you have to do in this assignment is you have to do the animation update function, the animation has ended function, and then inside scene play, that is the scene where you are going to implement all of the game physics, okay? Now, like I said, it's a bit of work, but it's not that bad. So let's look at how I recommend you approach this assignment. So I recommend approaching this assignment in the following order, which will help you debug your program along the way with minimal errors. Remember to do it one step at a time and to test whether or not what you have just implemented is working properly before moving on to additional steps, okay? So the rendering system has been set up for you. So let me show you what happens when you run the code that I've given you for the assignment, okay? So um, the menu system works fine. However, none of the level loading has been done yet. I have hard coded this, okay? Um, now I'll go through that sample code to show you how it works, but all of the rendering is done. It's just that you haven't loaded the level into the entity manager yet. So you can do all this stuff like press C, to see the bounding boxes. Um, let me maximize this again. So you can press C to see the mounting boxes. You can turn off textures if you want to, or you can print the grid to the screen um, by pressing G. All that stuff is already done for you. Okay. Um, this is a hint. You can implement the animation update and animation has ended at any time. Okay. It will not affect the gameplay me mechanics whatsoever. So what that means is you can do the whole assignment without Mega Man actually animating the running, right? That's really trivial. It doesn't affect gameplay. It just affects how it looks. So save that till somewhere closer to the end. Don't worry about the animation update stuff. Okay. The first thing that I recommend you do is implement scene play load level. So since rendering is already completed for you, once you correctly read in the different types of entities and add them to the entity manager, they should automatically be drawn to the screen. Add the correct bounding boxes to tile entities and no bounding boxes to the deck entities. Remember that you can toggle debug with the T and the C keys. As part of this step, implement the scene play grid to mid pixel function, which takes in as parameters a grid XY position and an entity and returns the VEC2 position of the center of that entity. You must use the animation size of the entity to determine where the point should be. So keep in mind that this means your entity must have its C animation component added first so that it can be used to calculate the midpoint in that function. Now that was a whole lot of talking. Let me show you what it means. So it means that when you go through in the level, let me load up the grid. If the level file says, put a brick at 5.3, right here, there's a function that I've given you skeleton code for called grid to mid pixel. And what it is, you have to calculate the, mid, the midpoint of this rectangle so that the bottom left of it aligns with the bottom left of that tile. Okay. And all you have to do is just do that little bit of subtraction. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give that to you. That'll be one of the fun things that you work on, but let's look at where that lives in the code. Okie doke. So inside the code here, um, this is the scene play class, and this is where you'll be doing most of your implementation. So the init function comes first. This is where you do things like registering actions, um, setting the character size, um, getting the font, stuff like that. And the init function calls load level with your level path. So let's go to load level. I'm going to skip over this for right now and we'll come back to that. So the load level function is going to 
create a new entity manager. So here, whenever we load a level, we wanna throw out everything that might have been there from another level and load a new one. So we create a new entity manager. So what I've done here is I've done some to do's and some notes, and then I have some sample code to show you how the new entity uh, syntax works. And I'll go over that in a second. So what you have to do in this function is read in the level file and add the appropriate entities. Use the player config struct m player config to store the player properties. So you've done this sort of thing before in assignment two. I've got a player config struct for you all ready to go. So you'll read the player file, you'll store all the properties in there, and you will also like load in all the bricks and all the tiles and all the questions and you'll put them in the entity manager. Okay, and then you'll spawn the player. Once you've loaded in all the stuff that tells you what the player and all the tiles should be, then you actually want to go spawn the player. Okay, so what I have done for assignment three, and I probably should have had a slide on this before, but let's just go through the code, is that I have changed how the entity class works a little bit to make it easier for you, okay? And it's gonna look complicated while I'm explaining it, but then when I show you the example, it's going to be very, very simple. So before what we would do, um, let me bring up uh, a notepad here. So I'll bring up a new notepad. So before what we would do is we would say um, something like auto E equals um, M entities, entity manager, dot add entity and we would give that like um we would give that a tag right so that's what we would do before and that's still the same nothing has changed about that however previously what we had was we would get um for example the entity we would get uh if we wanted its transform we would directly access the um, we would directly access the variable inside the entity. Uh, let me just make sure that I don't have a lecture slide on this. I don't think I do. No, okay. So we would directly access that that thing. And if we wanted to make a new transform, we would say this is standard make shared C transform and then we would add the arguments in here, okay? That has changed in this assignment. Um, what it has changed to is now you're going to say E add component C transform and then put the args in here, okay? So your code is going to be much simpler and much more robust. And you can also say E remove component C transform so what you would have done before is you would have said uh, like E C transform equals uh, null or something like that, whatever you would have done to set that up. But now it's E remove component. And before where you would have said if E C transform to see if something has a, a component, you now you're going to say if E has component C transform, okay? So the, the syntax of how you work with entities has changed, but the behavior is the same. So the way this works, um, I may actually in the next lecture go over how exactly this is implemented, but I'm just gonna leave this and I'll show you the sample code here. So what we've done is I've, I've used a standard tuple and some template magic in order to make this happen. Um, but the way you use entities is essentially the same, just the syntax has changed a little bit. So let's go back to the scene play. And now that you know that that has changed a little bit, we're going to show you how that works in practice. So if I run the sample program that I gave, we're going to have a brick with no bounding box we're going to have this block with a bounding box, 
and a question tile with no bounding box, okay? And Mega Man is gonna be up here with a bounding box. So let's see how we actually create those um, entities with those components uh, in the sample code. So here, let's add some sample entities. So I've given you this code. So I'm gonna say auto brick equals entity manager dot add entity tile. So this is what you're going to do when you load in your level is you're gonna say, oh, here's a new line of the file. It should be a brick. So I'm gonna say brick equals add entity manager tile. Then we're going to add the components, okay? First, we want this brick to have the brick animation. So the way we get access to our assets is that inside the game engine class, this is where the assets class lives and you get access to that via the assets function. So I say M game, that's the game engine. I ask it for the assets and then I say get animation brick. So that will get me the brick animation. So here, in order to set that animation on the brick, I say brick, add component, see animation, and then I get the animation from the assets and I say true because that is going to be a repeating animation. That brick is gonna repeat that one animated um, frame forever. Then I want to give it a transform, right? Cause it had to live somewhere in the level. So I give the brick, I say brick, add component, C transform, and then I give it a position of 96, 480, okay? Which happens to be whatever tile. So your final code should position the entity with the grid X, Y position, which is read from the file. So what you're gonna call is brick, add component, C transform, and then the input grid X and Y you're going to calculate the actual pixel position where that should live, and you're going to do that up here in this function, okay? So this function is going to take in grid X and grid Y, and that is literally the grid X and grid Y from this um, level file, okay? It's also going to take in the entity, and the entity's animation is going to contain the size of the animation so that you can position it properly. So once you've got this function written, you can position all of your entities in the level file, in the level really easily with one line of code. Okay. So for example, if at any point during your code, you want to know which animation does this entity actually have? Well, you can call the entity. You can say get component, see animation, dot animation, dot get name. So if we look over here at the components and we look at the animation component, the animation stores that animation class where all that stuff is there. And it also stores whether or not that animation should be repeated. Okay, so that's the brick. Let's look at the block tile. And if we remember the block tile has that one extra step of adding a, uh, a, um, a bounding box to it. So let's see how I did that. So the block, well, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add an entity to the entity manager. And then let me make this just a little bit bigger for you. Okay, that's better. Um, so we're going to add the animation. And this time it's block instead of brick. So that's fine. It's a repeated animation. Um, we're going to add the transform component, which is essentially the, the location of it. And we're going to add um, a bounding box component. And the way we get the bounding box component for a tile is that it should be the same size as the animation. So here I've said, okay, assets, get the animation block and give me the size of it. And that's how I know how big the bounding box should be for that tile. And then that sets up the bounding box. Uh, and lastly, I've set up the, the question mark. Okay. Please note that this is incredibly, this is an incredibly important note. Components are now returned as references rather than pointers. So if we look um, before, we could just reference the shared pointer of the component, but now um, we are actually re returning references to components. So it's a, it's a minor change, 
But if you do not specify a reference variable type, it will copy the component. So this line of code will copy the transform into the variable transform one. It is incorrect. Oh geez, where did I go? Any changes you make to transform one will not be changed within the entity. So if you're trying to get a reference to a variable to store like a reference so that you can change an entity, entities transform or another component multiple times. Here I've said auto transform equals entity get transform. So you can't do this because it's copying it into this variable. All you have to do is make sure that you're declaring it as a reference and then you're, you're good to go. Okay. So whenever you're setting up variables so that you can refer to components more easily, just make sure you're using a reference here. That's all that that's saying. Okay. So that's load level. So what should you do after? So once you finish load level, the level should be loaded and it should look like the solution. Okay. All the things should be drawn in the correct place because the rendering is already done for you. So um, let's look at the next thing. Next thing, you should implement spawn player. So read the configuration from the level file and spawn the player. This is where the player should restart when they die. So if we go down here, um, spawn player, what I've done, just as some sample code, is set up the player so that um, it has an animation component, it has a transform component, it has a bounding box component. Now, later on, at some point, Oh, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Now what you want to do is implement some basic W, A, S, and D up, left, down, and right movement for the player entity so that you can use this help test collisions in the future. Remember that you must use register action to register a new action for the scene. See the actions already registered for you and the do action function for syntax on how to perform actions. So what I'm going to do now for you is an example of how you would do this. Okay. So here you have your register action part up in the initialization function. Currently you do not have anything which is going to allow you to move around the scene. So what I recommend is let's just register an action, which uh, is moving to the right for example. So we go register action, SF keyboard. Um, let's do D for moving to the right. And then we're just going to call this uh, right. There you go. So that is how we tell our scene that whenever, or we're telling the game engine technically, that whenever the D key is pressed, I want to get the action right. Okay. So now down here in the do action function, now that I have an action called right, I can do something like this. So else if action.name equals right, well, what do I want to happen when I when right is pushed? Well, similar to assignment two, I'm going to get m player. I'm going to say get component, c input, right? That's the input component of the player. And now I'm going to say uh, right equals true. All right. So that's just saying whenever I've given the action, right, I want to tell my player's input components, right, that it is currently activated. Um, now down here, if it's the end of an action, then I want that to be equal to false. Okay. So this is what the do action for moving right is going to accomplish. Now, I have to actually do something with this. So in the movement system, I have to change somehow um, how the player's position is. So let's say, for example, that I'm going to just look at the player right now, and I'm going to say, uh, okay, I want to set the player's uh, movement based on its input variable, which I which we did in in assignment two. So how am I going to do that here? I'm just doing this live. I haven't done it yet. So if I screw up, I apologize. So first let's get a reference to the player's transform. So I can say auto um, transform equals uh, M player get component C transform. 
All right. So now I've got a reference. Oops. And I'm going to call that P transform, but I still can't type. So this is the player's transform. All right. So now what I'm going to do, let's say I keep saying that phrase, I'm going to set up a vec2, which is player uh, speed. And that's going to initially be just 0, 0. So I can set that to 0, 0. Then I'm going to say if, uh, okay, let's also get the player's input component. So p input, I can store a reference to that. This is going to be c input. Now, I'm going to say if p input dot write, so that's a boolean. What am I going to do if write is being held? Well, player speed, let me just change it to something, um, is going to be player speed dot x is going to be equal to, uh, let's say, three units per frame. This is actually specified in the config file, but I'm not implementing all of that for you. So now that player speed, um, is, is here and let me let me do left as well. So uh, if p input dot left then player speed dot x this is going to be plus equals three and this is if it's left it's going to be minus equals three right if we're holding right we want to go to the right if we're holding left we want to go to the left. So I'm not doing anything about left yet so let me just implement left movement. So here it's A, and this is left. Then we're gonna go down to the input system. Where is that? Here. So I can just copy and paste this, change it to left, change this to left. And then here, I'm change this to right, from right to left, and I say left here. Okay? So now, um, in the movement system, now that I have the player's speed, or velocity, I guess this would be player player v, that's the velocity. Um, I'm going to set the p transform dot velocity equal to player v, and then p transform dot position plus equals p transform dot velocity. All right, so if that went well, now when I run this and I go into the game, if I hold D, I'm moving to the right. If I hold L, I'm moving to the left, okay? The other thing I suggest you do is actually carry on with this. Let me uh, do something like this. This is a good starting point for you, so I don't mind giving you a little bit of help here. Let's do this up and down as well. So in the actual game, up is going to be jump and down is going to be handled by gravity, right? But for debugging purposes, until we get collisions working, let's make a little system here where we can sort of have this God mode where we can move up, down, left, and right. So. What I mean by that is the following. Let's put in two more things. So W is going to be up. S is going to be down. So this is up and this is down. Then we go back to our movement system. We have up and down now. So this is up. This is down. Okay. And now I can copy and paste this. Uh, this is up, and this is down, and this is up, and this is down. All right, so now if I run this, I should have a system in which I can move up, down, left, or right, except I've, I've yeah, okay, so I can move up, down, left, and right, that's fine, except uh, I forgot that moving down, uh, up is actually negative, and down is positive in the y direction. So let me just do that once more. Okay, so now what you can do is now that you have these bounding boxes and you're able to move them around, now you can like play around with the physics, right? So once you implement the physics, 
now you can have like a robust system for being able to um for being able to um test your your collision system and someone just in the chat just asked why is this a three i just put it there because i knew it would be an interesting value but in the actual assignment the player's speed is in in the config file okay i'm just showing you how i would go about um starting this to start debugging okay so that's what implement some basic up, down, left, and right movement to, to do that. So that's how you're going to implement it. However, once you get all your physics working, you're going to replace it. There's actually no down in the assignment, right? So you'll delete that and you'll change W to be jump. And then you'll play around with gravity and acceleration and all that kind of thing. All right. Back to the readme. So I show, we showed what the assignment was in like two minutes. But actually explaining the implementation is, it takes a while, right? So next, I highly recommend implementing spawn bullet next. So the bullet should shoot when space is pressed in the same direction that the player is facing. Holding down the space button should not continuously fire bullets. A new bullet can only be fired after the space key has been released. So use the cinput.canshoot variable to implement this. So what that means is down in your input function, you want to make it so when you start a shoot, the bullet fires, but not until you end a shoot can you actually shoot again. So holding down the space key should not continuously fire bullets. Only after it's been released should you be able to fire bullets. And inside the player's C input class, I've included a can shoot and a can jump variable so you can store those things in there. Um, next, implement physics get overlap. So inside here, I have uh, this physics of get overlap and get previous overlap. Okay, so inside the components, uh, as we explained back in the AABB lecture, transforms have not only a position, but a previous position. So what you should do um, at the beginning of your movement system is uh, you should almost immediately say that P transform, you want to say that the previous position is equal to the current position. Right? So what you do is you store the previous position as the, as the position that there is right now, and then you update the player's position based on the input or based on the physics. So then what you have is that ptransform.pause is going to be the new position and ptransform.previous position is going to be the old position. So down here, we have a uh, collision system somewhere. Yeah. So here is the collision system. And this is probably where you're going to spend most of your time is doing the collision stuff. The collision stuff is going to be implemented in the physics get overlap function. So we go to physics.cpp. Here is a get overlap function. So to do return the overlap rectangle size of the bounding boxes of entity A and B. And we did that you can almost copy and paste that slide into this and just turn it into C++. All right. And then the same thing, this function. So once you complete get overlap, you should be able to copy and paste get overlap into get previous overlap, except instead of using the current position, you're using the previous position. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. However, then what you have to do, I uh, just, let me just go back here. So um, implement physics, get overlap. That function should return the overlap dimensions between the bounding boxes of two entities. This is the same as the purple rectangle in the notes. Get previous overlap should be a copy and paste of this solution, except using the previous positions instead of the current positions. If either entity has no bounding box, then return zero, zero for the, for the overlap. Next, after you've implemented this, you have the tool to implement collision checking, okay? So implement collision checking with bullets and brick tiles such that the brick is destroyed when a bullet collides with it. Remember, 
a collision occurs when the overlap is non-zero in both the X and the Y component. So what you're going to do is you're going to call physics get overlap. And if the returned vectors X and Y are both greater than zero, then you have a collision between the two things. Bullets should always be destroyed when they collide with any non-decorative tile. Okay. Then you implement collision resolution so that the player collides with a non-decorative tile, the player cannot enter or overlap it. When the player collides with a tile from below, its Y velocity should be set to zero so that it falls back downward and doesn't hover below the tile. You'll see what, you, what I mean by that when you start to implement it. But basically, um, make sure that players can't enter a tile by the collision resolution. Okay, so bullets and bricks being destroyed, that's just collision detection. However, down here, you have to implement the collision resolution, where when you detect that there's an overlap, you push the thing back out in the proper direction. And we had a whole lecture on that. Then implement a way of detecting which side the player collided with the tile. So whether it was from the bottom or whether it was from the top. Okay, then change all of the input controls such that they are the proper left right jump style so note that all movement logic should be in the movement system the do action system is only used to set the proper c input variables if you modify the player's speed or position anywhere inside the do action system you will lose marks as it is potentially unsafe so what that means is down here you are not touching the player's position or speed or anything in this function. This is only the doing of actions, okay? You have to read these variables in the movement system uh, later. Then implement gravity such that the player falls downward to the bottom of the screen and lands on tiles when it collides with a tile from above. Note that when the player lands on a tile from above, you should set its vertical speed to zero so that gravity does not continue to accelerate the player downward. So ironically, the two things you do last are jump and gravity. Almost the, that is like the foundation of a, of a platformer. But what you wanna do is you wanna get everything else working first so that jumping actually makes sense, right? So that you land on something. You can't do that without collisions. So that is the order in which I recommend you implement things. And uh, there are a couple of other things that you have to do. One is the lifespan system. So the lifespan system has not changed from assignment two. You can almost copy and paste that code from assignment two into assignment three. And uh, the other thing here is you have to implement the animation system within the scene. So what that does is um, you have to first complete the animation class code that I talked about, then you have to set the animation of the player based on its state component. Now, if, an, anima if a, an entity currently has an animation, the way you change its animation is just by calling um, set component again. So if you have like M player and you call set component, oh, sorry, add component, my bad. So uh, C animation, right? You're going to call that with all its parameters. So that's um, that's the animation that, that you've added initially. If you add an animation again to the same entity, all it does is overwrite it. Okay? So um, it's not like there's two animations now. So if you want to change from running to jumping, then all you have to do is add component C animation with the new animation name. Okay, so add component overwrites the previous component. It does not add a second component of that type. And then the second thing is for each entity with an animation, call update, right? So here is where that update function actually gets called. And if the animation is not repeated and it has ended, destroy that entity. So that's where things like explosions get done. And then the rest of the code is just the rendering system, which is already done for you, okay? So it's not that much work, but it is probably more raw programming than you're used to for an assignment. But this is what game programming is, 
okay? It's implementing game physics. It's implemented data-oriented design. It's using ECS to implement these systems and these physics. And I think you will honestly have a lot of fun with this assignment. Here's how I picture your mental state will go for this assignment, okay? So this is your mental state on the assignment. So this is like, um, this is time and this is like happiness, right? You'll kind of start up here and uh, nothing will be working. And then you'll implement the load level function properly. And you'll be like, wow, this is awesome. Um, I've got everything drawing. And then you'll go to do collisions and there'll be weird edge cases. And you'll be like, oh my God, why isn't this working properly? And then you'll change a variable and it'll magically work. And it'll be like this. Okay, so this might be your mental state of happiness throughout this assignment, but trust me, getting here is worth it. I promise you, once you finish this, um, it's just, it's cool that you've almost made an entire game in the span of one assignment. I, I promise you, if you stick with it, it will be worth it. And then you implement some bonus features and this just goes, and, and it's, it's really cool. All right. That's assignment three. If I've missed anything, I don't think I have. Um, yeah, that seems like it's it. If you have any questions, I'm on Discord all the time. So just uh, just send me that or an email. And um, if you don't have a partner, you might want to get a partner for this one because it's a, it's, it's a lot of work. So that's assignment three. I think you're going to have fun with it. If we go back to the schedule. I'm blind for a second. Um, so assignment four, assignment two technically isn't due until Tuesday, but assignment three will be released tomorrow. The, the file will be there tomorrow. So if you want to get started on it early, you can, and you will have, well, 20 days from today. So, um, no, no, sorry. Yes. 20 days from today, um, to, to finish this. So you've got almost three weeks, but it's going to take up at least a week of that, I would say for the average student. So have a lot of time for like, start it early so that you have questions early for me. Okay. And the next few lectures will all lead into assignment four. And then after assignment four, the whole course is basically project work. And you may be thinking, oh my God, all these assignments and a project, how are we ever going to do that? Well, the thing is, all of this stuff that you've been doing the whole course, all of these assignments, you're going, your assignment, your, sorry, your project is just going to be an extension of assignment four. So after assignment four, you're going to have the game engine done. And then you just make like a game idea on top of that. So the whole class is feeding into the project, right? It's not just all of a sudden there is a project. The whole class is making way for this project that you're gonna be able to make this like fully fledged game for. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, the assignment will be online downloadable, let's say by like tomorrow evening, so Saturday evening. So uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks a lot and I'll see you in the next one.